It's a pleasure to speak to you today. And if you have any questions, please make sure that you write them down. I also will be at the reception because some people feel uncomfortable asking these kinds of questions. And I'm fine with your coming up to me later if that would feel more appropriate. So this clinical trial has nothing to do with genital graft versus host disease, but I've done a variety of different things. I'm doing a study uh, of the use of botulinum toxin in women with endometriosis-related pain. I'm hoping that I'll help you better understand graft versus host disease, um, both what I know in women and the minimal amount of stuff that's known in men and have you understand how that may affect sexual health and intimacy and what treatment options there are. I have spent, you know, spent about 15 years working on um, genital graft versus host disease issues at the National Institute of Health in a chronic graft versus host disease study group that that really looked across many organ systems. And that experience helped me think it more in an integrative way. So let's begin with female genital graft versus host disease. We think that it occurs in about 25 to 50% of women, and it affects the vulva, the external genital area, and the vagina, the internal genital area, but the lower, you know, not the uterus or the uh, fallopian tubes or the ovaries. Vulvar chronic graft versus host disease seems to occur about seven to 10 months at or later after transplant. And vaginal chronic graft versus host disease can develop even years later. Most of the time, it occurs when you have graft versus host disease in other organs, especially the skin and the oral mucosa, you know, thinking of the, the superficial surfaces. Um, it can occur independent of that. I, I have seen cases where there's only been genital graft versus host disease and not any other manifestations of graft versus host disease. Vulvar appears to be more frequent than vaginal, and treating the external vulva does not actually prevent vaginal chronic graft versus host disease. So it's important to distinguish external from internal. And sometimes women end up being confused, especially in the context of sexual pain, where, you know, because you don't see that part of your anatomy, where the, the problem is. I also want to mention human papillomavirus. We've found that the cumulative incidence of HPV infection in the lower genital tract was about 40% across women post-transplant. And the rate of HPV disease requiring treatment ranged you know, about 15%. Vulnerable subjects are people who have had HPV before transplant, um, or extensive chronic graft versus host disease or genital chronic graft versus host disease. So you might ask me, what is HPV or human papillomavirus? It's the viral, t you know, it's the, uh, when it occurs in the genital tract, it's the virus that's associated with cervical cancer and it can be associated with vulvar cancer. And that's why it's really important to screen and detect that. Um, and treating genital graft versus host disease may cause sort of an eruption in this viral infection there. So it's important to think about the two together. Uh, in the study we looked at in long-term survivors at NIH, we didn't find any HPV-related cancer when standard guidelines for screening were, were followed. So that's part of the reason why I'm mentioning that. And 
this long latency of HPV re reactivation, it may be several years, and that means that there's a window of opportunity for augmenting immunity through HPV vaccination. Some of you may be aware that, oh, since 2006, it's been recommended that young women get HPV vaccination. And then a few years later, it was recommended that young men get HPV vaccination. But like other vaccines, it's important to, to request that as part of your um, vaccination series after transplant. So I realize this is not um, what you'd naturally think about for genital graft versus host disease, but I, it's another genital problem that ends up being important to think about. So what do I do when I look for genital graft versus host disease in a female? And on the, on the right side of the screen, you will see sort of the external anatomy. What I do is I look for signs. That's what a clinician looks for. You come to me with symptoms, and I look for clinical signs, which, you know, it might be a rash or it might be... Um, fissures in the folds between the tissue. Uh, and I often gently use a cotton-tipped applicator to touch different areas to see if there's sensitivity there. Uh, and I use, in the vagina, one single finger to assess for scarring. And then there's the speculum exam, Women understand what that means, where they put in the, the metal or plastic contraption into the vagina in order to be able to see the cervix. And that enables us to look at the vaginal surface and to obtain both cytology, which is the pap smear, and HPV testing, or cultures, if we're trying to distinguish graft versus host disease from infections. So we developed a classification system to help us better communicate as physicians one to another about what happens for genital chronic graft versus host disease and classified it as mild, moderate, or severe, where mild is um, a redness just on the surfaces that might appear like a a lace-like red rash, moderate, may include breaks in the skin folds or open sores, and severe involves any form of genital scarring, either external, where the surfaces stick together, or internal, where the front and the back of the vagina stick together, or there are bands, ridges, um, all of which can cause pain with intercourse. Uh, to illustrate this, I, I have um, oop. So let me see. So this is the red area. As you can see, there is a a fissure here. This is um, sort of absorbed, and um, you know you don't see the lips like you would here. And, and this is someone who, where everything was sort of scarred together externally, which is really uncommon, but I want you to sort of have a, a idea that it might happen. And this external scarring is really when the lips of the vulva scar together. And as you can see on the the left side here, this is where it's all scarred together. Um, and on the right side here, it's scarred right here. So it narrows the opening and may make it painful during intercourse. Internally, there can be vaginal scarring and there can be fine scars that when I've seen someone very early with vaginal graft versus host disease, it's like cobwebs or there can be ridges along the walls in the vagina, or scarring of one wall to another, or I've seen sort of a curtain in front of the cervix. 
all of these things can make the vagina narrower or shorter than it usually should be. So it's hard because you as a patient might have a symptom, but since you can't really see to examine the area, you have to go to someone to look at this. And what we're doing is distinguishing menopause from graft versus host disease to what things that might happen with other biologics that are being used in your treatment. For example, with menopause, the skin can be, be pale, it can be dry, but it's not usually tender or painful to touch. There aren't any sores or open areas, and there isn't any internal scarring, but it can be narrowed because that kind of atrophy can happen with the lack of hormones. With graft versus host disease, there may be redness, it's tender to touch, there may be open sores that look like herpes, so, but when they're cultured, they're negative, so that herpes infection isn't seen there. There can be cracks in the skin folds um, and internal scarring. And with Things like a brutinab, there could be a rash that's like herpes, but is also culture negative. It's not usually tender to touch. There can be cracking. So I don't know. I'm mentioning this because as we continue to develop new treatments, there may be other biologics that have local skin reactions that we'll learn more about. So I'm going to divide treatment for female genital graft versus host disease into vulvar, which will be both the surface things as well as whether or not areas stick together, or vaginal, the internal. And from my perspective, the important thing that ha should happen in the context of treating vulvar disease is to recognize it early before scarring and things happen. And we usually use topical therapy of immunosuppressants and have, we use really super potent ones like clobetasol. And we use that daily until it heals and then it's tapered off. It's really important that that um, is tapered because if you continue to use it over the long term for fear of it coming back, it'll make the skin thinner and more um, fragile to damage with intercourse. And so there can be sort of a rebound of symptoms. So that's why it's, you use it daily and then you taper so that it, you, you're not using it except later when you have symptoms. Um, it usually heals when, within six to eight weeks. And once it's healed, sometimes it can have caused thinning of the thin skin thickness, so using a topical estrogen may improve that thickness. Uh, however, it's, if you've had a problem with blood clotting because of topical estrogen or have a hormone-sensitive tumor, you know, breast cancer that in the past or something, it's important not to use estrogen. So that is a decision that ends up being um, made with your doctor. So labial fusion, the scarring that can occur of things sort of healing together externally can be complete, like I showed you that extreme example, um, or partial, where I showed you that the opening was narrowed. And um, the complete scarring is best treated in, in the operating room where we gently um, have the, make the parts be apart, but it's because it's a painful, sensitive area, it's much better to be asleep for that. Uh, but I have also treated the partial labial fusion in the office by using you know, a topical anesthetic and being able to, to, to simply peel it apart. Uh, it may sound gruesome, but it's not. Um, and for
for either it's okay to have sex once it's healed and sex helps the area stay open and if you're not in an intimate relationship using dilators may help but if the pain persists or return or you recognize that the scarrings return re-examination is important to occur so for vaginal treatment the fine cobweb stars are easily found and treated during an exam um, we have found that topical therapy works best for the vaginal symptoms just like it works best for the for the vulvar symptoms the systemic immune suppression doesn't seem to affect effectively treat it so for the ridges there you can see on the upper right here there is a ring um, I have found that when I've inserted the ring in the vagina with someone who has sort of ridging down the vaginal wall they come back in a week or two and it's completely better um, and it lasts for for three months and it mechanically opens the vagina for scarring or narrowing or shortening I have tended to use the the dilators and have patients put both a topical immune suppressant drug on the tip and estrogen and then insert it in order to help to mechanically open it and then later use the estrogen vaginal ring you know it, it ends up being a bit of back and forth um, with visits to sort of check and make sure that it's things are moving properly but um, it's tended to be very successful even in challenging complicated cases so what do we know about male genital graft versus host disease there is very limited data there have been maybe two studies done um, but the only pu you know the the major published study that I've seen is about 150 men who were alive for more than a year where a dermatologist examined them all of the men 20 percent had genital skin changes and of those 13 percent had what we'd call the inflammatory skin changes like you see with with graft versus host disease on the skin or in the vulva um, 8% had an infl inflammation around the foreskin or glands and part of what happens with that from my understanding since I'm a gynecologist I don't treat men but I can tell you what I understand in talking to my urology colleagues it makes it hard for the foreskin to retract and so there's like an inflammation between the foreskin and the tip of the penis that needs to be treated with a topical agent and why is that end up being a problem because the foreskin can get can become like a band around the glands and that can make it difficult when you try to have an erection or try to move it back um, in, in order to void there can also be narrowing in the urethra so that there can be scarring internally um, and there's a higher incidence of it when like with women if you have oral ocular or cutaneous graft versus host disease so we we worked to develop a um, similar scoring system so we could talk among each other for men and classified the, the lace-like rash for as mild and the lace-like rash or the inflammation around the foreskin and the head of the penis is moderate and any narrowing of the urethral opening or inability to retract the foreskin covering the glands as severe sort of thinking about the scarring piece as well so how do we treat this topical immunosuppressants like we would do in females because the systemic doesn't seem to work and if there's narrowing of the urethra or its opening or you can't retract the skin the foreskin off the glands it would be a surgical treatment you know the narrowing of the urethra would be treated with something where you look inside the bladder and can 
cut the scarring as you go in. And, you know, the problem with retracting the foreskin would be to have an adult circ circumcision, which you would usually do under some sort of anesthesia. We don't know how common these symptoms are for men after transplant. I think of this as a don't ask, don't tell situation where men don't come and say, I have a problem there, and doctors don't look there. So we really don't know. Obviously, if there are these more severe problems with, with voiding, um, that would be, you know, you'd have to fess up about that. So I think that chron genital chronic graft versus host disease likely contributes to sexual dysfunction in men and women. So let's move on to talking about intimacy. In one survey uh, of males after transplant, two thirds of them had some sort of erectile dysfunction. Um, and it was more frequent in men who had genital graft versus host disease for the reasons I've already explained. Uh, and only 40% reported sexual contentment. So it's, it occurs and is underreported. It currently should be considered in men's who have, men who have difficulty voiding, blood in their urine, or problems with sex. So for female sexual function, we know that it's impaired after transplant. And 80% of survivors in, in the published information from almost a decade ago, they should know significant improvement five years after transplant. So it continues to affect us after the physical and emotional well-being have returned to normal. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Systemic graft versus host disease causes fatigue, changes in appearance, which alter our body image and may contribute to some element of perceived unattractiveness. Um, genital graft versus host disease can affect sexual function, as I've described. Uh, when the ovaries fail because of had it undergoing total body irradiation or having primary ovarian failure after all of the treatments you've had for, uh, in the context of, of transplant, that can make you menopausal and that also has an effect on sexual function. And there are other psychosocial factors like depression or self-consciousness and some medications that you might be prescribed can alter both your desire and your ability to have an orgasm. So we looked at the, a, a group of women after transplant and gave them HPV vaccine because I wanted to see whether or not it would mount an immune response. And we compared clinically stable women after transplant who are on, not on any systemic immunosuppression to clinically stable women post-transplant who required systemic immunosuppression to healthy volunteers and gave them all three doses of vaccine and then followed up at seven months and at 12 months. Um, and Along with this, we looked at sexual function. And I'm happy to say that the majority of clinically stable reproductive aged women after transplant, including those on immunosuppression, developed robust antibody responses that are similar to those that are seen in healthy women. So, and the full vaccine series can safely be administered to reproductive aged women, and I also venture to say men. Um, and the current use of immunosuppression or the prior use of rituximab after transplant does not preclude vaccination. So in this, as I mentioned, we looked at sexual function and we used 
you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit down in the details. We used a sexual function questionnaire that had a lot of different categories, you know, interest, desire, arousal, all the things that you might think would be important, um, and looked at baseline sexual function. Um, this, this sexual function questionnaire had been used previously in transplant fo populations and found to be uh, reflective of the, what went on. So we found that the baseline sexual function was lower for transplant survivors than healthy women. Um, and it was similar for transplant for survivors regardless of whether or not they were taking systemic immunosuppression. And those that had been sexually active before transplant had higher sexual function. However, with the sort of intensive sort of gynecologic and reproductive health care that comes when you enter into a study like this where you have someone who is looking to make sure that you're in optimized health, it, it actually helped improve sexual function. So um, the orgasm was higher at 12 months for all subjects. Uh, current chronic, current genital graft versus host disease predicted lower sexual function for any woman post transplant, uh, and that meant that genital graft versus host disease at any time point was associated with lower sexual function, and higher sexual function occurred in survivors who were sexually active before transplant, and sexual function was improved in the one year period for all post transplant females regardless of their prior sexual activity. So um, clinically stable women after transplant, regardless of whether or not they're on or off immunosuppression, experience similar levels of sexual dysfunction. And the largest effect on sexual dysfunction occurs in women with no prior sexual activity or who have current genital graft versus host disease. So putting sex and intimacy in the context of vulvar graft versus host disease, vulvar chronic graft versus host disease causes sex to be painful. You need to talk to your doctor if you have pain, bleeding, or difficulty having sex. Early treatment can help the symptoms resolve quickly. It's okay to have sex once vulvar graft versus host disease is treated and pain resolves. But if pain persists, reexamination is warranted. For vaginal graft versus host disease, vaginal scarring makes penetration impossible or painful. So if you have pain, bleeding or difficulty having sex, an examin examination is needed. You cannot diagnose yourself. If you're treated early at the cobweb stage, sex can resume soon. With dilator use, once the dilator size of your partner is tolerated, sex can resume. It's OK to have sex once the area is healed. Sex can occur with the vaginal estrogen ring in place. If the pain persists or return, returns, reexamination is warranted. So how do I put this together to think about what screening and care recommendations I would give you after transplant? If you have any other graft versus host disease, mention any genital symptoms you have as possible genital graft versus host disease. For women, Ask for referral for gynecology evaluation if you have any genital symptoms like bleeding, pain at rest, pain with sex, or when you pass urine, if it's painful externally, or if you have open ulcers. Males should ask for referral for a urology evaluation if you have any genital symptoms like spraying of the urinary stream, difficulty retracting the foreskin, pain with intercourse. Females, at an annual exam, you should be examined for genital graft versus host disease. And females, if you have extensive genital graft versus host disease or known 
genital graft versus host disease, it might be wise to do a gynecology exam every three months with a cl- by a clinician with expertise in gynecology and um, post-transplant care. So for men, I have no idea on what which to base the recommendations because it ha- this hasn't been studied very well in men. So in terms of the treatment, generally the, both the immunosuppression and the estrogen have to be res- prescribed by a doctor who ha- is knowledgeable in genital graft versus disease, host disease and can monitor treatment. And from my perspective, that's usually a gynecologist. Um, males, the similar treatment is prescribed by a urologist who has knowledge of post-transplant issues. Um, any genital graft versus host disease for men or women is probably best treated with topical immunosuppression. Females may use dilators and if no contraindication topical estrogen. Females can, for, with labial fusion or complete vaginal stenosis, that's treated with surgery, followed by dilators, topical immunosuppression, and topical estrogens. Males, scarring of the foreskin or within the urethra is treated with surgery. And for both men and women, there should the area should be inspected for evidence of HPV disease. You know, the little cauliflower lesions that are wart-like. Um, so for HPV assessment, when a woman is looked at for genital graft versus host disease, it's important to inspect the whole genital area for vulvar, for um, HPV disease. Men can also be inspected in that way. What that also, in addition to the inspection, pap smear testing annually, especially if they had pre-transplant HPV or extensive chronic graft versus host disease or genital chronic graft versus host disease. The HPV testing is performed for high-risk types. Those are the ones that are cancer-prone. And you're referred for assessment um, if there is abnormalities for colposcopy with biopsy of the area. I, I recommend everyone consider HPV vaccination. And in terms of screening for other sexually transmitted infections, that's usually done based on risk factors. Given the high incidence of HPV and generally later occurrence, uh, our results suggest that vaccinating women up to age 50 combined with periodic cytology and HPV screening would be a practical approach to reducing HPV-associated squamous intraepithelial lesions and cancer in this population. Um, For sexual function, report pain with sex dyspareunia, low sexual desire, any problems with arousal or orgasm, treat any underlying hormone, meaning endocrine conditions or medical conditions. For females, consider vaginal estrogen or lubricants for pain with sex from menopausal changes. Treat genital chronic graft versus host disease and refer to a psychologist for individual or couples therapy. So in summary, Intimacy and sexuality can decrease the emotional distress and improve our psychological response to life-threatening disease and complications after treatment. This sexual response can be altered by chronic graft versus host disease, medications, psychosocial factors such as anxiety or depression or body image changes, other life stresses, decreased self-confidence, fear of disease recurrence, and concerns related to infertility. The impact of a serious illness on our sexuality and reproductive health is often not a concern expressed by patients undergoing treatment for a major medical problem, but I urge you all to consider this as part of your health. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Stratton. Um, really appreciate all that excellent information that you provided. We are now going to have a Q&A. So Dr. Zhao, I'd like to invite you up um, so that you can be a part of the panel. And just a reminder, if you do have questions, raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. We need to have all of us mic'd while we're speaking because we are recording the presentation. So we'll get going with our Q&A. Hello. Hello. I, um, I'm over the age of 50, but I did have HPV prior, like when I was 50. I'm 63 now. So would, should I still get that shot? I don't see any reason why you can't. Mm -hmm. We just don't have any, we don't have any um, information about your immune response. Mm -hmm because I didn't study people over age 50. But if you're getting the other vaccinations, it oh, won't yeah. hurt you. Mm -hmm. The FDA recently um, approved giving HPV vaccination to women up to age 45. Um, and that's the reason why you know, I arbitrarily cut it off at 50 because I have data on the immune response up to age 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. My other question is, um, I ended up having, after my transplant, I had a blood clot three months later and then nine months later, and I had gone to a doctor and I told him I had a history of blood clots and he um, gave, gave me the E-ring and I ended up with a blood clot three months later. <laughs> So what would, what is there for me? Because I had a hysterectomy. I don't have any fallopian tubes, any of that. Well, so, so the estrogen vaginal ring, there are three different levels mm -hmm. for the estrogen vaginal ring, a really ultra low dose a, and two higher doses. And I don't know which dose you got. Yeah, I'm so not it's sure. important to know what was prescribed. Because if it was a higher dose, then that's, that could be a problem. There are, if you had the lower dose and you still had a clot, you probably shouldn't take estrogen. Mm -hmm. And there are other things that can be used for lubrication. Mm -hmm. um, there can be, there are water solu soluble lubricants, oil soluble lubricants, and silicone related lu lubricants. And in people who have studied this in the context of breast cancer, which is a common time when you wouldn't be able to use estrogen, mm -hmm. using the silicone lubricants appears to last longer during sex. Mm -hmm. okay. And so it's one of those things where you probably should ask the pharmacist um, because the names and the brands are always changing, you know, and these, you know, when you go to, to I, I know that there's something called liquid gold or something like that, that, that or liquid platinum, that is one of the silicone-based things, but you can read the package, but you can also talk to the pharmacist and, and use that, and that should make sex more comfortable. So now if you've had a hysterectomy, you're not, gonna, you're not at risk of cervical cancer. Right. In what I've looked at in terms of long-term follow-up, it's really vulvar cancer that also has increased an HPV-related post-transplant. And so that area should be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, it probably should be that in addition to asking for HPV vaccine, you should make sure that you're still looked at and tested for, you know, a lot of times gynecologists now are saying you don't need to have a pap smear if you've had a hysterectomy and you're over 60 or 65, but it probably would make sense for you to be looked at, assuming that everything else in your health is good. So how do I find a doctor that understands that and not just a regular? Oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> You know, I, I just think you have to stick up for yourself and say, you know, I know that this is a risk and I want you to do this. I mean, would they know what to look for if they yeah. don't understand? Well, um, so there are, 
there are a group of gynecologists who are really interested in what you call vulvar diseases. And so it may be that going to a, a vulvar disease clinic may be more helpful for you than going to a routine gynecologist. Mm -hmm. And they would be more able to provide you with the help you need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Have you seen success with people that have gone to, or women that have gone to physical therapy? Physical therapy for pain? Yep. Like for women's health physical therapy? For so you mean pelvic, pelvic floor physical yep. therapy? So assuming that all of the genital graft versus host disease is diagnosed and treated, and that the area is not too narrowed or short. Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, the thing that I gave you the disclosure for, I've just finished a study of using Botox in the pelvic floor of women who have endometriosis-related pelvic pain and found that pelvic floor spasm is a very common finding in those women and that some of them don't really tolerate the pelvic floor physical therapy because they have so much pain that even that they go through a physical therapy session and then they end up suffering in pain for a couple of days and using the Botox actually breaks that cycle and actually allows them to use that do that kind of physical therapy okay other questions are making me run. How do you treat the fine cobweb scars? So in the two or three times that I've seen them, I just have found them and wiped them away. And then what I have done is put in a vaginal estrogen ring and have the patient come back a couple weeks later. And in, in both circumstances, everything is fine then. So like wipe it away with what? Like your hand? My hand, because oh. I find them during the exam. Okay, they just come off that easily? Yeah. Okay, I was just curious. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to know if you have any um, history or records on uh, people that have lost or their whole cervix has been scarred over and what the success rate is on surgery for that. Like, my cervix is gone. It's scarred over. Like, they can't even do a pap smear anymore. Well, they can do a pap smear, but they're not... They're not successful. ...doing <laughs> a pap smear. So they're not getting... So um, to back up... And I finally had to go to a, a actual. Um, now I lost like the word I was trying to come up with. Um, I was going to my normal um, gynecologist, and they sent me to an oncologist gynecologist now. In order to try to see if they can. And do they want to do surgery, but I don't know how the success rate is with that. I, it's not going to be very successful. Okay. And you know, I'm not sure. Only because they also found cancer. That's why I'm... You mean cancer of the uterus, cancer of the cervix, cancer of the vulva, cancer of the vagina? The vagina. Okay. So it may, so it may be that the... I have seen this one other time, and the appropriate treatment then was to actually remove the, He wants to go take the, some layers out. Right. Remove the area that has cancer. Um... And in this other case, the uterus was also removed because of the concern about whether or not there would be something hidden. Because when, so the, the cervix, the cervical opening and canal is um, smaller than a straw. Right. And 
So trying to open it and have it stay open, what we would do is um, find where the canal is, cut externally to be able to open it, and then we, we kind of stitch back the area. But because it's only, it's only the diameter, you know, smaller than this cord, um, it's, it's really easy for it to heal closed again. And if you, if you have cancer there, what they want to do is get rid of it. And I have chronic graft versus host of the skin, so I have two things like are against me right now. Right. So, so the reason why cancer of the cervix ends up being potentially a problem is that as it spreads locally, it can close off the ureters, which are the connection between the kidneys and the bladder. So if you have the area that's a problem removed, including taking the uterus um, and wherever is affected in the vagina, then you won't get, then, then they can just do pap smears of the vagina and see if there's any abnormal areas. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were serious. Anyone else have questions? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for all the, the comments and the information. Um, I'm almost 60. I had a bone marrow transplant last year. And I have some graft versus host disease going on. Um, but it's been a long time since my husband and I have had sex. And I want to do it. And I'm wondering, like, how long do you wait? Are you guys doing it? What did it take to get it done? Um, you know, I really miss that part of our relationship. Um, and so, you know, all this medical stuff is good for me to know, but like, I want to know the real deal. <laughs> so, from my perspective, what's going on behind if closed the doors? Area is okay. You should try it out. Take it for a test run. <laughs> not have high expectations at first. I don't know whether or not you have any other input in that regard. The only comment I would say is you're definitely not the first person to ask that question. I assume others here would not as well. And it is to say that as Dr. Stratton separated, sex and intimacy are not necessarily the same thing. And from what I've heard, a part of what you're missing is the intimacy and not just, say, penetrative sex. Yeah, well, you know, he's my caregiver. <laughs> so the intimacy is hard, too. Absolutely. You know, he sees everything from the medical side and then... Now we want to go, you know, be smooching under the blankets. And I, ju I just want to get there, <laughs> you know, so. So it might be that you go to someone like Dr. Zhu because having a, a space to talk about that since it's really important to acknowledge the fact that he's your caregiver and your partner. And how do you go about that? And, and you have fears, and he likely has fears. Um, I, I remember one patient I saw who had horrible skin graft versus host disease that, that sort of made her skin like leather and made it so that she couldn't pull her knees apart so that it made it really hard for her, and her husband was afraid he was going to break her. He's a much bigger person. And she had genital graft versus host disease at the same time. So it was, how, how do you manage all of those things? And they, they were really committed 
to working that out. And they were able to successfully work it out. We were able to treat her genital graft versus host disease, get her skin disease better, end up having her hip mobility improve. And, and it worked, and they were able to have sex. She is one of the patients in my, in my Gardasil study. All right, one more question, and then we're going to be out of time. But we have time for one more. Um, I went to the skin graft versus host disease session, and he talked about clobetasol. And he's like, well, you wouldn't want to use that in your vaginal region. And I went, oh, I'm using that. And you said it was OK to use. But I'm wondering, maybe it's the percent. Maybe, and I was just, and what percent do you usually use? It is the clobetasol that he uses. Okay. And I, I'm, I respectfully disagree. Okay, that's okay. Um, I, I don't think she's just, she's here in the room, but there's a patient who came up to me who had reached out to me 15 years ago. And she was having problems where her, her caregiver, you know, her physicians thought that she had a chronic urinary tract infection. She talked to me on the phone and she told me that today that I listened to what was going on with her on the phone and told her to use clobetasol. And she had been suffering for six to nine months. She used clobetasol for one day and was better. Okay. Okay. And you just um, recommend, and I've never tapered before, so you recommend the tapering of clobetasol. Yeah, so I do, because it really makes the skin thin, and that's probably what the dermatologist was really concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's one of the things where I, I recommend that you sort of get familiar with your anatomy, where propping a mirror up and looking and putting it with a Q-tip where there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, if it, it's sort of hard to, for some women to, to have that close relationship with their anatomy, but if the lips cover the area that is bothering you and you only put the clobetasol on the lips, it's not going to get better. So it has to be directly applied to the areas that really are painful and reddened and irritated. So we actually do have time for one more quick question, I realized. Anyone else in the room want to direct a question to Dr. Stratton or Dr. Zaho? Excellent. Um, hi, I'm eight years post uh, stem cell transplant. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so I took mine for a test drive, like you said. Excellent. And it works. The problem is wanting to take it for a a test drive is a huge issue with me and I'm wondering is there anything that will help that I mean my husband poor man feels like like it's him and it's so not him um, it's just me is there anything so so from a gynecology perspective there's a question about whether or not if you had something like testosterone which affects arousal okay. that might help and whether or not any of the medications you're on might be altering your arousal and interest. But I also think that turning to Dr. Zell might be a good plan because there might be other things. Yeah, it is to say there is one drug that is designed for increasing women's arousal or women's desire. And if you look at the uh, clinical trials data, it increased the number of days of desire, I think, by like 0.5 out of 30. So it was essentially useless. Right. For this situation, we often think about the idea of using it or losing it, and you didn't use it for a very long time. And that desire is a, it's a habit. It's a habit that you can reform, and it begins with starting to create time for the event. And it will feel uncomfortable, awkward, even silly at first, and that's okay. Because you were there before and you can get there again. It's for having somebody who routinely meets with you, keeps you accountable, 
and helps you and your husband have a dialogue and a conversation about what your fears are, what you are desiring, what he is desiring, can often be helpful. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, I am going to wrap us up. I just want to thank Dr. Zhao and Dr. Stratton for your answers to the questions and to all of you for your willing participation today. Um, so on behalf of BMT InfoNet, I just want to thank you. Don't forget to complete your evaluation forms and drop them off at the registration desk. And I hope you all enjoy the networking groups this evening. Thanks. Thank you.